Long ago, way back in the last century, when school children learned facts, lots of facts by rote, knowledge of Irish geography largely consisted of lists of towns in each county and what were the chief products of those towns. For Tipperary Town it was easy, butter and gloves, products that appear to have nothing in common, except, of course, they do, cows, of which there was no shortage in the Golden Vale. Thanks to the success of Tipperary Cooperative Creamery, milk remains the lifeblood, so to speak, of the local economy. Gloves, not so much. That's the point about fashion. It changes, sometimes very slowly, but it changes. Look at any old photograph from many decades ago, and if it's an outdoor scene, all males, men and boys, have some shape of cloth perched on their heads. Probably not as universal, but no woman and few men would think themselves well-dressed without wearing gloves. In 1898, Cleves Brothers built their processing plant on a site on the Fair Green, immediately beside the river and close to the railway station. A few years later, in 1906, the Founds Brothers Company established their glove-making factory in the town. Neither family was Irish. Cleves were Canadian, originally English, and in 1777 John and Thomas Founds established their glove-making business in Worcester, on the River Severn, south of Birmingham. The company is still in business, having become international and diversified into a broad range of leather-based fashions. Gloves are still manufactured by the company. Thanks to John Founds, Worcester became a centre of the glove manufacturing business with over 100 companies employing around 20,000 workers, turning out millions of pairs every year. In Tipperary Town, in January 1905, business interests got together and formed the Tipperary Merchants Association under the chairmanship of Louis J. Dalton, member of a well-established business family with interests far wider than mere commerce. Louis Dalton's father published an Irish-language journal for a time, Louis Dalton's brother led the landlord-tenant struggle, now remembered for New Tipperary, and Louis Dalton himself was the most prominent local member of Sinn Féin and, in the 1920s, a TD. The Merchants' Association included other prominent shopkeepers, names like Rutherford and Millay, and the chairman of the County Council at Tipperary, MD, J.F. O'Ryan. The new association concerned itself with promoting new markets for eggs, calves, wool, improve rail connections, better utilities, including establishing a telephonic connection with the town. A failure not just of the association which did its best, but a failure on the part of local investment was the collapse of plans to establish a bacon factory, which would have been a good economic fit. As was pointed out at the time, large sums of money are lying idle in our banks and why no effort is made to employ them in developing local industries is a mystery if englishmen and others find it pays to start factories here in our midst far away from their own head centers would it not be equally open to local capitalists this report rightly blamed lack of enterprise and speculative spirit Inward flow of capital and investment was, of course, stymied by the Sinn Féin economic doctrine of self-sufficiency, for so long a bedrock of economic thinking in independent Ireland, and was of no advantage to Tipperary in the early 20th century. What brought the Founds Brothers Company to Tipperary Town? It was with some excitement that the Tipperary Merchants Association in August 1906 announced that the Founds Brothers intended to establish a factory in the town. The company had already expanded from their Worcester base, even to the United States, and a reason given why Ireland was their experience in England with the skill and reliability of Irish workers, mainly female. The company's first contact was with George Townsend, agent for the Barrymore, Smith Barry Estate. He lived at Cordangan Manor, and Tipperary Town may have been chosen because of his endeavours. Certainly, he visited the Founds plant at Worcester and was much taken by the fact that the girls sang at their work, 
which was from 8 in the morning to 6 in the evening, with an hour for lunch. As he noted in a letter to Louis Dalton, two of them had spoken often about the need for industrial development in the town. Also, of course, the town and its representatives did everything to accommodate the English firm. The idea was that after a year, around 30 girls would be trained as machinists and that they in turn would train others. A qualified girl could earn from 9 to 11 shillings a week. A more ambitious plan was to establish apprenticeships for boys to become cutters, for which no fees would be charged. Usually the family of a boy getting an apprenticeship paid for the training. The Irish Department of Technical Instruction was to be involved in providing some of this training. The local press, reflecting public opinion, was enthusiastic and noted that while the new concern would begin small, there was scope for tremendous expansion should the enterprise flourish. Associated with this glove-making enterprise in Tipperary was a glove-making school, which was very much promoted and supported by the Tipperary Merchants Association. The school was possibly located in the main street opposite the Bank of Ireland, presumably in premises to the rear of the building. By 1915, the local technical instruction committee, a government agency for the support of trades and training, was backing the school. In keeping with the general trend to maximise the Tipperary brand, because of the extraordinary popularity of It's a Long Way to Tipperary, there was a hope that officers, certainly in Irish regiments, would make a point of wearing Tipperary leather gloves. Due to the fact that glove-making was seen as mainly a female occupation, it did not feature in the very wide choice of trades and occupations that were available when Tipperary military barracks functioned as what was called a command depot, meaning a centre for the rehabilitation of wounded soldiers. By war's end, everything was different, and Found's brothers appear to have cut their connection with Tipperary in 1919. Kathleen Cleary was around 15 when Found's brothers set up in Tipperary town, and by the time the census was taken in 1911, she and her two sisters were living with their widowed father at Emmett Street. She and her sister Mary, who was 18, were listed as glove makers, which is not the most interesting thing about Kathleen. The Founds Company was already in Tipperary when a branch of the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union was established. And quite uniquely, by the time the Founds Company closed their business in Tipperary, Kathleen Cleary was branch secretary a very unique role in a very male-dominated world. It began badly and did not get much better. No other provincial town endured so much during the War of Independence and Civil War. A downward spiral that included the prohibition of fairs and markets, which were the economic sinews of the town and district. Destruction of property, terror on the streets by day, murder gangs by night. And that was just the war against the British. When it came to the Civil War, the town was again in the front line, as the state was being forged in fire and blood, while the anti-treaty side withdrew from other towns in the county when faced with superior firepower. In Tipperary Town, the beating heart of the Republican cause, it was decided to fight it out. The only result of this was a number of deaths, including a child, and the destruction of many of the town's key resources. As early as the mid-1920s, there was resentment that towns where hardly a pane of glass had been smashed during the struggle for independence now prospered while Tipperary town languished, having suffered blow upon blow, disaster upon disaster. Why? Probable reasons include inadequate representation at national level, including indifference, even resentment towards the town from one prominent politician, the sustained Republican assault on infrastructure during 1922-23, a government in the 1920s that did not forgive the region's anti-treaty identity, the convenience of the simplistic label Garrison Town for subsequent administrations, a reputation for labour radicalism from the Soviet experiment, and the universal truth that governments don't do gratitude. Newspaper headlines from 1925 told the story as good headlines do. Tipperary's losses. Now the town suffered in national movements. Industries swept away. At a public meeting in 1925 of the political party in power, 
Many of these matters were discussed, especially the economic disaster of the aftermath of the Salahed Beg ambush, when a person was not allowed to bring a basket of eggs into the town, which, after all, was nothing if not a marketplace. Ironically, the pro-government TD from the town, on hand to defend all that was being done for the town, was the very same Louis Dalton. His message was that it was up to the local people to bestir themselves and see what could be done in the way of starting industries. Then the government would help, as it was already doing through the Shannon scheme. In keeping with Sinn Féin doctrine, Dalton went on to attack the idea of outside investment. There must be protection for industry. Like any politician, Dalton was comfortable sharing political pablum, comprising slogans and generalisations, but very much not at ease when skewered with specific questions about the creamery, the barracks or the Irish house where there was an ongoing saga about the compensation money and what would be done with it. Two years later, what was called a sad story of the distress prevailing in Tipperary Town was a subject for urgent discussion by Tipperary South Riding County Council. The government was asked for £1,500 towards immediate relief and that the Minister for Local Government would receive a deputation to discuss longer-term strategy. The scale of the economic losses endured by the town was itemised. The War of Independence reprisals, up to 60 incidents. The military barracks burnt down, affecting maybe 1,500 personnel. Cleves factory burnt down, 300 jobs. The Irish house burned, 60 jobs. The Abbey Grammar School closed, affecting maybe 50 personnel. The Casein factory closed, 50 jobs. The Lactose factory closed, 50 jobs. Bright's Mineral Water Factory closed, 20 jobs. British Ex-Servicemen Training Facility closed, the loss of about a £10,000 per annum budget. And then the Glove Factory closed. However, with an enthusiastic parish priest, John Nolan, who died in 1942, to the fore, early in 1933, there were plans for a glove factory, building on the tradition of the earlier factory. By mid-year, there was confidence that the £3,000 of local investment could be secured. An industrial development association did what its title proclaimed, and after a very great deal of lobbying, by 1935, a new industry and the revival of an old one promised economic improvement. Clearly, an immense amount of community endeavour went into the projects, but there was also frustration as time passed and nothing appeared to happen. In August 1934, there was a meeting in Dublin between Minister Lamas J.F. Darcy, a Tipperary solicitor and Tipperary Industrial Association member, and representatives of Messrs. Phillips, a well-known British glove-making enterprise. Their representative travelled to Tipperary and met obvious people, and a big incentive was that some cutters and other employees of the old Founds Brothers factory were available. Some months later, in the spring of 1935, the glove factory story remained encouraging. Something was definitely going to happen. At this point, a second industry with 50 jobs is mentioned, but not a liner factory, but a foundry being established by a private company with which Dan Breen was associated. A possible site was the old military barracks. The company even had a name, the Galti Spring and Iron Works. Like other enterprises mentioned for this site, a foundry was, if you like, a more substantial shadow than most. Up to that year, 1935, the ruins of the Irish house, with its gaping blackened walls, was an ever-present reminder of all that had been lost and never restored. An official neglect admitted by the Minister for Agriculture, James Ryan, when he visited the area. In January 1936, it was decided that the official openings of two new factories needed to be celebrated, and so a civic week was planned for that summer. The official openings of two new factories, one of which was not a foundry, was on Monday, the 8th of June, 1936, when Sean Lamas, the Minister for Industry and Commerce, arrived in Tipperary to find the town in festive form. By then, both concerns were up and working. The Lino factory, for example, began production in February that year. The products of both companies were primarily for the home market, and each limited company had local shareholders. As referenced previously, persuading well-off individuals in a locality to take some of their money out of the bank and invest it locally 
so that jobs were created was always an uphill struggle. Both factories were near the railway station, the liner factory beside what was the workhouse and the glove factory finding accommodation within the old workhouse. The former had around 50 employees while the glove factory provided far more jobs, three times as many, but as all but 20 or so of those were for females, its enterprise was overshadowed by the lino factory. The first manager of the new glove factory was an Englishman, Raymond Bolter, member of a family long associated with the glove business. The managing director was Alec Baird, and by the time of the official opening, the factory was turning out 150 dozen pairs per week, which was enough to keep the hands of around 900 people warm. Apart from selling their gloves directly to shops, Tipperary Glove Factory Limited also used a distribution agency called the Leinster Trading Company. Operating within a protectionist environment had its advantages, but dumping was not prevented, and in 1939-40 there were complaints about the unfair competition from cheaper Italian-made gloves. Concern was strong enough to cause the Tipperary workers to meet and through their trade union, protest against what they saw as the inactivity of the government. They also made the very obvious point that local people should not buy other than Tipperary made gloves. Which is it? The workers in the Tipperary glove factory or the workers in the foreign glove factory spend most money in the town of Tipperary. For all the talk about government support during the start of these enterprises, by the following year, 1937, for whatever reason, Official backing for the glove-making classes in Tipperary was withdrawn, leaving the factory management to protest in vain and scramble for an alternative arrangement. In 1937, in order to draw in new capital, extra shares were created, and by 1941 there was a trading profit of around £1,700 and the payment of a 5% dividend to preferential shareholders. Perhaps the most influential figure in labour politics in Tipperary Town at that time was Joseph Cahill, a veteran of the War of Independence and long-time member of Tipperary Urban Council. He was on the management committee of the glove factory, though not personally a shareholder. Cahill was also secretary of a body called the Tipperary Working Men's Society, and in March 1941 told his colleagues how he protested at the recent annual meeting of the glove factory against a dividend being paid while 15 employees were walking the streets of the town idle and some of them trying to exist on six shillings unemployment assistance. The tension was perhaps inevitable between those who had invested in the enterprise and wanted a return on their money and those who wanted to maximise jobs. Life in rural Ireland in the 1930s was in every sense parochial. Perhaps after the excitement of the years between 1912, with the Third Home Rule Bill, and the end of the Civil War in 1923, society drew comfort from safe, familiar faces, speaking with familiar accents and sharing the same values, attitudes and, it should be said, prejudices. In contrast, think about what was happening in Europe and elsewhere. In April 1939, at a meeting of Tipperary Urban Council, a motion was brought forward, against which no one demurred, that we view with alarm the apparent indifference of the government to the continued employment of foreigners. The specific complaint related to jobs in management. In the discussion, it was mentioned by Joseph Cahill, with reference to the glove factory, that we have nobody competent at present to take up the job of running the place. It was exactly this need that brought the insular and safe world of Tipperary into contact with the cosmopolitan and dangerous world of continental Europe. On the night of the 9th of November 1938, urged by the Nazi government all over Germany, Jewish property was attacked, an episode that was precursor to much, much worse. On that day, so much glass was broken that the event has entered into history as Kristallnacht. Wunsch and company was a glove and hosiery factory in Bergstadt, a small town near Chemnitz, which is southwest of Dresden. There were several hundred employees, including home-based peace workers. One of the two partners, and very involved in running the business, was Ernst W. Konigsberger, who was 53 years of age. Both he and his wife Gertrude, or Trudy, were raised as Protestants. However, their background was Jewish which in Germany at that time was all that mattered. 
That Konigsberger had served in the Great War as a staff officer mattered not at all. It should be remembered that victims concluded at each stage of their descent into hell that this was as bad as it would get. As conditions became more threatening, in 1936, the Konigsbergers sent their son Peter to school in Britain, followed later by another son. The Protestant status of the family allowed them to maintain a position in their business until April 1938, when Ernst Konigsberger was dismissed. A few months later, just after Kristallnacht, he was arrested and sent to Sachsenhausen concentration camp north of Berlin. The family had business and social contacts in Britain, and through what one might term the glove manufacturing grapevine, Gertrude Konigsberger learned that a glove factory in Ireland, in a place of which she may have heard because of that song, was looking for a general manager. Prior to the outbreak of war, people were still allowed to leave Germany, something that suited the regime. People they did not want left, and if, like the Konigsbergers, they had money, they had to pay. And so the family was saved. As was common, business people with international contacts spoke English. Nevertheless, these two cosmopolitan Germans, familiar with high culture, must have found it a challenge to adjust to their new life in Tipperary. Gertrude Konigsberger had trained as an architect and was a very good musician. They first lived in a flat in O'Brien Street and later rented the entire house. The manager's salary was £364 per annum. After some years, and presumably in light of his expertise, this salary more than doubled. Family tradition recounts that while their money was stolen by the German state, the family was able to ship some of their furniture to Ireland most memorably a tiled stove and a grand piano. Their sons at school in Britain were able to join their parents for the first time in Tipperary in the summer of 1939. One can only imagine the adjustments needed to adapt to this new life in Tipperary, away from extended family in Germany, though safe now in Ireland, at a remove from the cultural markers that enhanced life and confusingly, perhaps, exiled because Jewish, though in practice actually Protestant. It was likely that the German identity caused little difficulty with most of the Roman Catholic population in Tipperary, whereas it would have been more problematic with the Protestant community, within which in time this new family integrated. Eventually, Gertrude was organist in St Mary's Church of Ireland in Tipperary. There was, of course, that link between life in Germany and in Ireland, cabbage. In Ireland, grossly overcooked and with bacon. In Germany, sauerkraut. What helped this process of assimilation was that by 1940, the family changed its name, literally translating their German name so that Ernst W. Konigsberger became William King's Hill. Unsurprisingly, an eye was kept on them by the Irish Intelligence Service. Official interest being shown in what photographs were being taken by the family when they had them developed. By 1944, Mrs. Kingshill was mentioned as the piano accompanist when a local singer performed on Radio Erin, ironically perhaps performing songs by Beethoven. And Konigsberger, William Kingshill, remained as manager of Tipperary Glove Factory until he retired in June 1951 when he was succeeded by Richard McCarthy. Having become an Irish citizen, William Kingshill remained in Tipperary after retirement and died in July 1954. He's buried behind St Mary's Church of Ireland in Tipperary Town. Very shortly afterwards, his wife sold up and left the town. In 1952, in the glove factory, around £8,300 was paid in wages and a 4% dividend was agreed. Over the next few years, trading conditions became more difficult, and by 1957 the company was trading at a loss and soon closed down, a blow to the town, but also to the many Tipperary families for whom the glove factory had become a way of life. In March 1958, there was an auction of machinery from the factory. In the following years, smaller-scale manufacturing of gloves continued in Tipperary, very likely using some of the machinery from that 1958 sale. James and Grattan Streets became the locations for these enterprises that were run by Billy McCarthy, Davy O'Dwyer and Hugh Kennedy. 
There was also a glove factory in Banshire run by Jim O'Connor. In Ireland, the 1960s was a decade of enormous transition. Think about how much the 1950s had in common with earlier decades, which is not a statement to be made about the 1970s. With so many changes, ladies no longer wearing gloves for reasons of fashion seems a very small thing, but nevertheless marked the closing of a part of the story of Tipperary Town. The following is a fictional drama of life in the glove factory. The characters portrayed are not real, but it seeks to accurately give the viewer a glimpse of the issues of the day. It's the late 1950s, a time when an insurance stamp was paid for the first time on behalf of workers, and a shorter working week was enjoyed. Saturday work was no longer compulsory, and was paid as overtime if required. The women working in the glove factory are concerned with the social issues, such as the weekend dancing and trip to the pictures. The issue of emigration is also an important factor in their lives. The young men are working in the liner factory, and the glove factory is both men and women employed. Though earning and living at home, youth must have its fling, and poor conditions and bleak prospects lead many of the younger generation to up sticks and seek their fortune in England. The atmosphere, however, is cheerful and optimistic as we eavesdrop on the factory floor on a Friday morning in April. Maggie, are you going to the tower on Friday night? Yes, I'm going with my Dave. I'm so excited. Mick Dell is playing. Oh, I can't wait. Hey, girls, are you going? Bet your life I'm going. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I bet you're hoping Billy Fitzgerald will be there. She's mad about him, aren't you, Joan? Look, girls, she's blushing. Stop it. I just like to dance with him. He's a great dancer, that's all. Are you going, Mary? No, I can't. Auntie Birdie is coming to visit Friday night and Mammy says I have to stay home to meet her. I'm raging. Uh, that's such a pity. You're going to miss a great night. Excuse me, girls. Please pay attention to your work. We're under pressure to get this order out and I hope there'll be no rejects of your work. I'll be checking the orders before it goes out and nobody leaves until it's ready. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes, yes Mr. McGrath. Girls, nowadays, their heads full of nonsense. And every Saturday off, and overtime if they're called in. What is the world coming to? In my day, we never had a Saturday off. Girls, I bet you don't know the latest news. How could we know any news? We're here sewing these bloody gloves since half past eight. Madge, quick, tell us before Miss McGrath comes back. Jim and Helen have eloped. <gasps> Only gone off to England and got wed. <laughs> they went uh, Sunday last. Jim's got a job in Dagenham, in, in the Lucas factory. Do you know what? I think they make batteries for cars. Never mind bloody Dagenham. What about Helen? She was the best one of us to sew if I say so myself. What'll she do there? Is there a glove factory there to her? Will she be like his wife and keep the house tidy? Have his dinner cooked for him when he comes home in the evenings? I'm sure married women don't work in England either once they're wed. I'd love to be getting dinner for my Dave. Maggie Doyle, please remember that the women of this town who worked here and earned their living in this factory after they got married, were allowed to work from home in the evening time, sewing gloves, and glad to have it in between having babies. And they were a sight more responsible than you lot, because of course they were paid piecework. Any sloppy work resulted in no money. So, back to work girls. The sooner the order is ready, the sooner we we'll all can finish.
Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Mrs. Ah, Miss McGrath. Did that order come in from Begley's yet? Yes, Mr. Grogan. It arrived in the post this morning. It's in the office. Good. Uh, if you have a moment, I'd like to go through it with you. Certainly, Mr. Grogan. Mr. Bisley. Tea's ready. Will they be lonely over there in England, Helen and Jim? Jim has a brother over there. Maybe it was him who got him the job. I think if you had some family over there, it wouldn't be so bad. Oh, I don't know, Dora. I wouldn't fancy it anyway. I'd miss living in Tipperary. Away from all my friends and you lot too. Are we not your friends too? <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. You know what I mean. Hey, Dora, are you going to the tower on Friday night? Of course I am. Girls, do you remember the dress material I bought in the Black Rock? Yeah. Well, Aunt Nora has the dress all but ready. She just has to add the bow and those fancy buttons from the haberdashery. Oh, you'll be the belle of the ball. The rest of us won't get a look in. Morning, ladies. Look what the cap brought in. If it isn't Valentino and his pal. Well, what do you want then? Excuse me, Miss Maggie Dial. Respect for your elders and your betters. <laughs> we have just come from the cutting room where we have been stretching this leather all morning, especially for your fair hands to sew into an exquisite Ooh. pair of gloves as only you can. My flower? Oh. And to introduce my latest apprentice, Seamus. Well then, who's a poor creature that has to be dealing with you? Oh, Seamus Watch. A fine specimen of manhood from Hollyford, no less. Mm, Come to learn his trade at the feet of the master. That's <laughs> myself. Oh. Uh, so, tell me ladies, and tell me no more. Are we all on for our little trip to Tremor in July? Who's collected? Huh? I too, Bob, born in a hole here in my pocket, and I've informed our young apprentice here that we'll have it all paid for and be ready to go by putting our few Bob aside weekly. Yes, Mick, I'm collecting. I'll write you in the book here. And your young friend. Uh, can he speak at all, or are you appointed to speak for him? Oh, indeed, he can, Maggie. Mm. Uh, just a bit in awe of me, you see. <laughs> and uh, terrified of you, lot, <laughs> and with good reason. Uh, still, uh, we'll be in the... Back seat of Timmy Donohue's bus. And uh, if you'll treat me right, I might walk you to the metal man. Oh. And <laughs> if there is a young, shy girl here, young Seamus here might do the same. Is it okay if I bring in my two bob tomorrow? Of course it is, Seamus. Seamus! Mary might want to go on the back seat with you, wouldn't you, Mary? <laughs> Don't be trying to embarrass the lad, Joan. <laughs> Seamus, will you be going to the tower on Friday night? Uh, no, I'm not much of a dancer. And anyway, I haven't any way of getting there. Oh, that's a pity, Seamus. We could have shown you a step or two if you had been there. We might have even gotten a squeeze out of you. <laughs> Michael Ryan, have you not worked to do elsewhere instead of distracting my girls? Miss McGrath, tis well you're looking this morning. Uh, no one in Tipperary could hold a candle to you. 
And uh, might I be so cheeky as to inquire if you're free to come to the ball with me this Friday night? Michael Ryan, please go back to your station across the road. You're a cheeky young pup, and I've a good mind to report you to your boss. Mr McCarthy would be surprised, I'm sure, by your guff. I know your father, a most respectable man. I don't know where he got you. I'll take that as a no, then. Mm. I, I'll, I'll be off, so. Uh, come, Seamus, my bye, and let these good ladies do their work. Uh, we'll be all together in tomorrow in July, and they'll be putty in our hands. Stretch me legs. I have a cramp from sitting all morning. Oh, who's coming now if it isn't Nancy? Watch this now, girls. Bike parked carefully against the wall, boxes under her arms, full of gloves, no doubt. Come away from that window, Winnie Toomey. Look, Miss McGrath, Nancy has just arrived. Nancy, as punctual as ever, and the goods ready. I knew I could depend on her. Not like you lot. Not a screed of concentration have you this morning. All agog about the dance Friday night, and style, and young men. Asher, we're young and full of dreams, Miss McGrath. Soon enough, we'll be rearing children, and glad to sew gloves on piecework to feed hungry mouths. True for you. What would we do without those piece workers, Mrs. Butler and Mrs. Houlihan? Should their dingers on the machine? and so reliable. Now, back to work, girls. And so we take our leave of the factory and its workers. The last remaining glove factory closed in James Street in the 1970s and the industry and its workforce are but a distant memory. Many of the men and women who work there and in other factories are still alive and have contributed to this film. The adult children of others have told the story on behalf of their parents. We are extremely grateful for their contribution. Gloves are a fashion accessory still in demand and there is a company in Dublin called Horn Gloves providing a bespoke product in the traditional way. Horn Gloves, run by George Horn these days, has a connection to Tipperary Town and Billy Larby and Martin Hanley, both worked there having served their time in Tipperary. Billy Larby was granduncle to the Tuohy family and three generations of that family worked in Tipperary Glove Factory. And so the making of gloves continues. the 1950s. I worked in David Dwyer's. It was in um, Mary, Mary O'Dwyer's. It was at the back of Mary O'Dwyer's. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, in the beginning we worked in the old house which was three stories. In the bottom story they done the cutting and the shaping of the leather. In the middle story then they had the machinery. And upstairs then there was an office that Davy worked at. It. And after that then he extended down the back and there was quite a, quite a lot of us. There would have been about 18, 20 of us working there. Billy Blondell. Once the factory closed down and Billy McCarthy's 
where they were doing it, that all closed down. Then he started working at home. So he'd have the sheepskin leather. What he had was the table, like paper patterns, and a ruler and a scissors. And he cut them all and then they'd be all piled up to be put in boxes to be posted. I have very fond memories of my mother uh, as a child sitting at her sewing machine at home. My mother used to do leather gloves and these just weren't the mittens now. These were, you know, the full five-fingered uh, gloves. That's right, um, painstakingly, um, every um, night when we were going to bed, we could hear the machine and it humming away. And she used to make 13 pairs to the dozen. We're talking about the 1930s onwards. I suppose it would probably be one of the main employers, I would say, uh, at that time in Tipperary, you know. And my mother worked in the office there and uh, my father worked, I suppose, in the cutting room or whatever. And uh, I think that was how they actually met. And uh, then subsequently, my father went to Bantra and worked in Bantra with Jim O'Connor. Oh God, a great place to work. Station Road. Oh, I'm not sure it was 8 o'clock now, 8 o'clock I think, we had a clock in. Any hop that was ever on, I was restless. I never missed anything. Oh, the tower, yeah. Oh, anyone, anyone good. Mick Delahunty. Oh God, very good memories, yeah.